So the flood was on the earth forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose up above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high mountains were under, that were under the whole heaven were covered. Now, if you have a, the highest mountain, right, all of the high mountains, and all of the high mountains are covered in water, what does that tell you about all the low places? They're also covered in water. Y'all aren't just good at math. You can do engineering, too. A lot of people don't, uh, don't recognize this about the text. I was taking a, uh, an apologetics class from an old earth guy who was helpful in pushing me further and further away from his perspective. <laughs> and uh, one of his points was, well, yeah, whenever it says that the, the mountains were covered, the Hebrew word actually means, like, just brought up against, not covered, you know. So I did a quick search. I'm thinking the word for cover is like Kippur, right, or something of that sort. And it's not. It's a different word. So I thought, oh, go. Perhaps he is right. This was only a local flood. Then I did more studying on the word, and this word is also used to, des to describe how clouds are over the earth. Do clouds just kind of come up and touch the earth, or do they exceed above the earth? They're above the earth, right? So... That one fell flat whenever I studied. All flesh that moved on the earth died, bird and livestock and beasts, and every creeping thing that crept on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils were the breath of life, and all that was on dry land died. I had someone trying to tell me that the uh, great pyramids of Egypt were built prior to the flood. Okay. Okay. I am willing to accept this if you can show me that the Egyptians did not breathe through their nostrils. Because everything that breathed through its nostrils, pfft, dead, no more. So he blotted out every living thing which was on the face of the ground, both man and animals, and the creepy things of the birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. The waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. Or as we say in East Texas, a hundred and fifty. So this raises some questions. What about the fish? What about fungi? What about plants? Um, don't you know, you stupid young earth creationist, that some fish live in salt water and some fish live in fresh water. And if you put a salt water fish in the fresh or the fresh water fish in the salt, they die. Being as how we still have fish today from both, the flood could not have actually happened. The Bible is wrong. Jesus did not die for your sins. So we can go forth and live our debaucherous lifestyles to no consequence, right? Wrong. So with fish, it turns out that you can actually uh, acclimate a freshwater fish to more saline and a saltwater fish to less saline. Uh, there have been folks that have slowly but surely introduced less and less salt for this one and more and more for this one, and then they can get saltwater and freshwater fish to live together in the same tank. Pretty cool, if you do it kind of slowly. Also, if you have the entire earth suddenly being tossed about with water, um, there are ways for salty water to sit at one level of uh, an ocean and then have less salty water at another level. You can go down to past Christian, Mississippi, for example, and they got a nice little bay which isn't very salty, and you got some little uh, shrimp that live there. And if you go a little bit further out into the, uh, the Gulf, it'll be more salty, and you'll have more salty fish there, right? So it's possible then that during the flood, there were certain spots that were more salty and certain spots that were less salty, and fish were able to live in their respective environments. Now, it's possible that a lot of fish died during this flood. It's possible that there are even kinds of fish that went extinct during the flood. Okay, God does not promise the preservation of the kinds of the fish here. 
However, we only need two, a uh, pink one and a blue one, to have survived in order for there to continue to be fish to this day. It's interesting, there are even kinds of fish which have species in the salt and species in the fresh. So there's a way for fish to have been adaptable here. What about plants? Uh, so Charles Darwin accidentally showed how this could work. <laughs> Uh, one of the experiments he did was for was uh, submerging submerging seeds, putting seeds in water and letting them sit there for a long time and pull them out and plant them. And turns out that a lot of seeds are actually very adaptable. They can live in watered up environments for quite a while and still come down on land and be planted. It's also possible that a plant could have had a branch ripped off. It, that survived and then ended up in the dirt and sprouted out from there, right? All sorts of ways for plants to have survived. Again, many could have gone extinct. It was a pretty devastating time. So in the case of plants, you don't necessarily need a pink one and a blue one. It could just be a single one. Sometimes they're able to self-replicate in certain ways. Um, fungus, very much the same, right? as well as bugs and other things that don't breathe through their nostrils. It's possible that the, um, whenever the flood took place, the earth is blowing up and bursting forth, so it's blowing logs all over the place. It's not just a nice, clean lake of clean water covering the whole earth. No, it's a chaotic mess. Trees are being blown out. The water is not just clean water, it's going to be a lot of muddy and stuff, which comes into play whenever it starts cutting through the earth as the waters recede. So there could have been log mats floating along where little bugs and snails could have attached. You could have had fungi living off of that. Um, branches of trees and seeds could have survived through that. And then when the water comes back down, the life, which does not have its life breathing in the nostrils, could have populated from there. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. All right. <clears throat> so, chapter 8. Um, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. So, God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water receded. So, a supernatural occurrence, God interfering with this wind. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of heaven were closed, and the rain from the heavens was restrained. The water receded steadily from the earth, and after the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Now, the water is a big muddy mess. It's cutting through as it decreases. There's likely to be land coming up. We'll talk a bit more about that later. The ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, on the mountains, plural, of Ararat. The water continually decreased until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Now, nah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. First question, have we found the ark? Uh, no, we have not. There have been uh, five proposed locations for the arks, and there are problems with all of them. First one is uh, Mount Suleiman. Um, let's see. There's a particular rock formation there that some have said is probably the Ark, but that's probably just a formation of rock layers. It's not a wood formation upon closer examination. Durupinar is one that an archaeologist named Ron Wyatt claimed to have found. Now, I don't typically uh, attack a lot of archaeologists uh, by name, but Ron Wyatt is one that I would advise caution with. Ron Wyatt said that he found the Ark of the Covenant, that, the, uh, that God just showed him this Ark of the Covenant and then hid it away. And he says that he took a blood sample from the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and that this mercy seat had a blood sample that had 24 chromosomes instead of 46 like regular humans have. He says this is the blood of Christ. In his words, all of us have 46 chromosomes unless we have Down syndrome. Christ had 24 chromosomes. Each parent supplies 23. Uh, 
Christ got 23 from his mother. He got one from his father, and it was a Y, which made him a male. He got it not from an earthly father, or else he would have 46 like the rest of us. Okay. So Ron Wyatt says that he found the blood of Christ and that the blood of Christ only had 24 chromosomes. This is a very serious accusation because in doing so, he is denying the full humanity of Christ. You see why? Humans have 46 chromosomes. Chromosomes, According to Ron Wyatt, Jesus only had 24. This is a denial of Christ's humanity. If Christ did not have full blood, then he could not have died for our sins, and then we would really be in a world of hurt. Okay. So Ron Wyatt is just a, uh, a hoax artist trying to, to build a name for himself. I would advise caution with that guy. So Durupinar, which he found, I would find very suspect. Three locations have been found on Mount Ararat, or proposed on Mount Ararat. The Ahura Gorge, which has a uh, uh, reputable young earth creationist who has recently passed away, was a, a big fan of that one. The Ararat Nami expedition is probably a hoax if you've ever seen this picture. There's a group of uh, Christian apologists that are claiming that they found the ark but won't let anyone tell us know where it is. There's another anomaly on Mount Ararat that is also likely a rock formation, not a boat. So what then? We can't trust the ark because we haven't found it. Actually, to the contrary. The Bible says that the, bio, that the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat. So these three are unlikely because they're on Mount Ararat. Statistically, since there are a lot of mountains there, that it would be on this one particular one is rather unlikely. But after the flood, there would have been a lot of geological changes, a lot of volcanoes exploding and earthquakes and stuff. So it is most likely that the ark has since then been destroyed and is unrecoverable. Okie dokie. So if there's not an ark that is found, that aligns with what we would expect. So we don't have the ark. Aw, bummer. Which is unfortunate, because I really want to know what gopher wood is. <laughs> then, so verse 6. Then at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went to and fro until the waters were dried up on the ark. Then he sent out a dove to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark for the waters were on the surface of the earth, of all the earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. He waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. The dove came to him in the evening, and in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So, how did that olive leaf grow? Well, if it was a branch of an olive that had broken off, and had been sort of planted. Often, whenever you do that to a plant, roots will come out. Then it could have already had the leaves or already been prepared for leaves. It didn't have to grow from the seed, in other words. Make sense? Okie dokie. So, Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. He waited another seven days and sent out the dove again, but it did not return to him. So, was the globe, the, was the flood global? Um, some critics will point to this passage and say, see, this is not describing a global flood because earlier it said that the tops of the mountains had become visible, and here it says that all of the earth was covered. So, since we have mountains sticking up whenever the wa all of the earth is covered in water, we shouldn't take all of the earth covered in water to mean that it's covering the mountains. Does the, uh, the accusation here make sense? Right? They're saying earlier in verse 5, in the tenth month on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. So here's the water, the mountains are visible, Therefore, whenever it talks later about all of the earth being covered, that doesn't include the mountains. 
That's what the folks are saying. Now, is that accurate? I don't think so. So what does it mean here? Well, first of all, if you still have a mountain sticking out, then theoretically your dove could just fly over there and rest her foot, right? But uh, let's think about this. So how big is the ark? Its height was 30 cubits, 30 of these, which is better than anything the metric system has ever come up with, by the way. <laughs> the waters prevailed upwards, and the mountains were covered 15 cubits deep. It says so in 720, right? Now, the draft of the boat. Can anyone tell me what a draft is in a nautical term? We don't have very many beaches here in. Right. So the distance from the water line to the bottom of the boat, right? So if you have a boat, the more water you put in, or the more stuff you put in, the further down it sinks, right? So we'll say that the draft was one third of the arc. So one third of the arc is underwater. There would be about 10 cubits of arc below the water and still five cubits between the mountains and the bottom of the arc. So the ark could still fly around in there, right? The top of the ark would be still 20 cubits above water, and then the water decreased for 74 days. Then the tops of the mountain were visible, and then he waited 40 days to send a raven. Okay? So it's possible then that whenever it discuss, talks about the tops of the mountains being visible, that they could have been visible from the top of the boat, which is sunken into the water a little bit, and they're looking down into the water and seeing the tops of the mountains through the water. Does that kind of make sense? So whenever it says that all of the earth is still covered when the tops of the mountains are visible, that's how it could work out. Make sense? Okay. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, often there are simple answers to seemingly difficult questions. So in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark. Right? Noah took it off. God put it on. And he looked and saw the surface of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So how long was the flood? This, this is a little bit more of a tricky question, mathematically speaking, than how many genders there are. So, it started on the second month, the 17th day. Noah was 600. Then we get continuous rain for 40 days. Then the prevailing of the waters for 150 days, including the 40 in which there was rain. So, minus 40. Then the waters decreased. 74 days, 40 days before the raven, and then the dove is sent, and then the dove is sent again, and then the dove is sent a third time, and then the waters are dried up on the first month, first day, when Noah was 601. So the grand total is 371 days. So a little bit more than a year. People think of this as just being a month-long rain from above. No, it was awful. It was a lot worse than that, right? Over a year of water everywhere. <laughs> a lot of destruction. And so they come in for a landing, right? It's possible that they still had, like, dead animals kind of lingering around. They've been dead for a year now, right? Right? goodness, if you have a giant brontosaurus that's been knocked out and you don't have any buzzards to come pick at them, the first uh, birds lo lo that loose that could eat them are those ravens, this thing is probably stinking up something terrible, right? They walk out, all of the land has been destroyed, it's not this beautiful, lush, foresty area that could have existed prior to the flood, it's just a desolate wasteland of knocked over trees and freshly cut what rivers are running through. We're likely talking about a very cold time, a lot of ice-agey snow and ice everywhere. 
Not a pleasant sight, to be sure. All the more reason I don't like those little giraffe depictions. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went forth. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, and everything that moves on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. So if you see it today, and it's a creeping thing or a livestock, it's got a grandpa that was on the ark. A minority of animals are clean, so it might have had a couple of grand grandpas on the ark. Okay, we'll discuss more of some of the uh, geological stuff that happened. But it's likely that we had an ice age, as I've already alluded to. So when the kangaroos hopped off of the ark, they would have had land bridges, so they could have hopped their cute little selves down into Australia. Um, the animals, the livestock, all would have spread out from there. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every, of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Okay. Oops, my bad. He took of every clean animal and of every clean bird. Um, oh, by the way, um, ah, we'll get into that here in a bit. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma. This is the first reference to God smelling in a, a soothing aroma, by the way, which is interesting. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night will not cease. Okay, so God makes this promise in his own heart. Makes the promise to himself first. Then, 9-1. Okay, so this is where this, uh, this hour's discussion is supposed to begin. We're running a little behind. That's okay, though. I put most of the information in the front, so, so don't worry. I'm not going to keep you here all night, goodness. Then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and all that moves on the earth and all the fish of the sea will fear you and be terrified of you. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you. I give you everything just as I gave you the green plant. So, at this point, man is now authorized to eat animals. Prior to this, he was not authorized to eat animals. What was the diet like in the Garden of Eden? Vegetables, right? They were vegetarians. God gave man all of the plants to eat as food. Okay, well, this brings up an interesting paleontological question, right? I would say that not only the humans were vegetarians, but also the animal world. It wasn't until the sin that death enters, and now we start eating each other. So we come across the T-Rex skull, my favorite dinosaur. Uh, do you have a favorite dinosaur? Any other T-Rex fans? Yes, I knew it. My paleontologist friends, they always love these, these niche dinosaurs that nobody's ever heard of. Nah, man, I'm straight up T-Rex all the way. <laughs> Big, scary dinosaur. Yeah. Now, if you look at the T-Rex, he has sharp and pointy teeth. And so, it has been um, concluded that the T-Rex has always been a carnivorous animal because he has sharp and pointy teeth. Here is another skull that has sharp and pointy teeth. So, 
What do we derive from this animal? Knowing that he has sharp and pointy teeth, is he a carnivore or is he an herbivore or do we not know? A reptile? No. It's a fruit bat. Very good. Right? Which eats fruit. So it turns out that when you find an animal that's gone extinct and he has sharp and pointy teeth, the only thing that you know about him is that he has sharp and pointy teeth. Okay? The sharp and pointy teeth convention could fit well in a vegetarian world of the Garden of Eden. Of course, it's also possible that animals were cursed after the fall in ways that they started eating other animals and they needed sharp and pointy teeth. So it, it's possible that not everything was vegetarian after the fall. We go through the fossil record and we find a lot of this business going on. One fish eating another fish. It's likely that a lot of our fossils came from the flood itself. So here we have an animal that died prior to the Noahic Covenant that's eating another animal. We caught him in the act. Okay, well that's not problematic at all. It's possible that some animals went meat eating, but the humans were not allowed to go meat eating. Of course, just because humans can't eat meat doesn't mean they didn't. It's possible that when Lamech killed that young man that he ate him, right? The Bible doesn't say one way or the other. But it wasn't permitted for a man to eat meat until after the fall or after the flood. So if we have carnivorous animals on the ark, okay, that's another problem. How do we feed them? Um, well, it could be that some carnivorous animals are capable of eating vegetables as well. So they could have been fed uh, plant fodder. Uh, some have proposed that they had like a turtle fodder, fodder, fodder tortoises, a bunch of little baby turtles that they would have fed to the, the bigger, hungry, meat-eating dinosaurs. I disagree because how many turtles kinds were there? There would have been two from each turtle kind or if there's only one turtle kind, there would have been two turtles. If you fed those to the dinosaurs, we wouldn't have turtles today. We do have turtles today, so probably not turtle fodder. Uh, it could be that Noah and his sons had uh, beef jerky kind of technology, that they would have dried up meat and put it on the ark to feed the animals. That's possible. A problem would be, though, that being as how they weren't meat eaters, why would they make beef jerky? Unless there were some sinful people out there killing animals and eating them and making jerky out of them. There are multiple possibilities, right? So meat-eating dinosaurs on the ark is not at all a problem for our perspective. Okie dokie. All righty. And there are other possible solutions as well. So... Genesis 9, 4. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. But for your own lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal, I will require it. Of man, too, will I require a reckoning for human life. Of every man, for that of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So this is the text of the uh, Noahic covenant which God gave to Noah and his sons as the law for the dispensation to come now. Some of you may have cheated and read further in the book of Genesis than we have discussed. Such cheating is highly encouraged. Man is told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Does he do that? No, he fails. They say, let's build a tower, let's stay together, let's make a name for ourselves. And as a result, we get languages, and which... As someone in a translation ministry, I tell you, God did a thorough job of confusing the languages. So, this first bit, 
Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So this is an early clue to the connection between life and blood. Okay? There is a messianic element here. It's not that God was trying to give a messianic prophecy, but he was explaining that the connection of life and blood go together. We've already seen the necessity of shedding blood, killing living animals for sacrifices, for the covering of Adam and Eve after they sinned. Well, this blood motif is going to keep going. Once we get into Leviticus, we're going to start seeing how it really fleshes out. <laughs> Flesh, blood. <laughs> and then finally, ultimately, when the Messiah is sacrificed, he has to pay with his blood to take away sin, which is interesting. Uh, there's a pastor who passed away a number of years ago who's very influential. I love a lot of stuff he said, but he got in a lot of trouble for saying that the blood of Christ was not necessary. Oh, no, 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 no. The blood of Christ very much is necessary. Okay, moving along. Now, in the Noahic Covenant, we get the basis for which divine institution for those of us that were here for Jacob's talk? Right, civil government, right? One man watching out over another. Now, in the previous dispensation, what did we have? Conscience, right? Every man following his own heart, the whole Pinocchio blue fairy number that ended in total debauchery. So now man is put over his fellow man. This is a divine institution. It's something that God put in place, right? So every evangelical Protestant would agree that government comes from God. It's a divine institution. It's not made up by men, right? Especially those that are most influential, right? Especially those that have written novels, that have been turned into movies, that have been sent all over the world, right? Double especially those that are being promoted by certain evangelical organizations, even as far as Ukraine, because, oh my goodness, those movies are so good and so artistically done, right? Wrong! Does anyone know who William Paul Young is? I'm going to put his name out there. Are you familiar with The Shack? All right, did you see the movie The Shack? If there's any, any, any similarity between The Shack and the Bible, I assure you it is entirely coincidental. William Paul Young is a classic heretic. He, he promotes petropassianism, which is the form of modalism that says that God the Father was on the cross with the Son. Blah, 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 so on and so forth. Total goofball, right? And he's very influential in the Protestant evangelical circles. Well, what does he say about government? He says, government is not something that was instituted or originated by God. We built it. If you want to find the roots of political power, look no further than the book of Genesis and to Cain, who had just murdered his own brother. Within five generations, Lamech, is wielding ruthless political power, taking women as property and giving his own daughters names that reduce them to objects of physical attraction and objectification. Every nation state on the planet exists because of the bloodshed of brothers. The only option to the insanity of political empire is the kingdom of God. Ugh. Now he does talk about some of the interesting stuff. I alluded to the, uh, the names of Lamech's wives and daughters, I believe. But it's, that's not the foundation of government. Government came with the Noahic covenant, right? It's not just some structure that we use to oppress each other. God put government here. God told us to form governments. Later, in a couple of chapters, we're going to see the divine institution of national distinctions come out. And then you apply civil governments to that. And then we really get rolling. But the accusation that government is just something that sinful man came up with in order to oppress each other, no, no, that's not right. Now, that said, government is often and very frequently corrupted, right? Corruption runs rampant in every government. I'm not familiar with a single government that doesn't deal with corruption. But God has multiple divine institutions and multiple checks on evil, 
right? Here, we see him putting out the death penalty, right? If you disallow men to run around killing each other, evil is going to increase. So he put this in play to put that into check so that we don't just run around killing each other, so that the murderer dies and that ends it. Make sense? Okay. Now there's another interesting bit here. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. So there's the accountability to each other. For God made man in his own image. Okay? So why is it not okay to kill a man? Right, because he's made in the image of God. He's an image bearer of God. Now, it's interesting. The, uh, there are a lot of uh, doctrinal disputes and discussions about the likeness and image of God. It's interesting. God made man in his likeness and image. His image is still here, and because of our God image, it is not okay for us to kill each other. So it seems then that this image is an aspect that continues on even after the fall. Likeness is not mentioned here. However, likeness and image of Adam is talked about earlier. So one of many anthropological martyological theories here uh, would be that the likeness of God has been tarnished, and so we have a sin nature. And that likeness, the sin nature is being passed along and along and along and along and along from father to son, father to son, father to son. And so it's significant that Jesus did not have an earthly father And so that sin nature was not passed along. Well, he still remained fully human. Pretty nifty, right? All right. Again, God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, every beast of the field that is with you, Of all that comes out of the ark, every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, what does man need to do on his side of this covenant to make sure that God doesn't destroy the earth with the flood? Nothing. It's a unilateral covenant. God swore himself, I am not going to do this. He told man, this is what you need to do. But he did not say that my preservation of the earth is contingent on your obedience to the command. Isn't that interesting? And has God destroyed earth with a flood yet? No. And is he going to? No. So what does that tell us then later on whenever God cuts a unilateral covenant with Abraham, swears by his name that he'll preserve the seed? Is he going to break that promise? But what if Abraham does something bad? What if all of Israel does something bad? No, right? When God makes a unilateral covenant, he keeps it because he's God. Then God said... This is the sign of the covenant, which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you. Isn't this interesting that he's also cutting the covenant with the animal world as well? And the animals can't mess this up either because they're not being held to any standard to maintain the covenant. There is indeed a condition for animals put in place, remember? If an animal kills a man, what happens to the animal? He dies, right? But it doesn't matter how many Men, the animals kill, God's not going to destroy them with a flood. I have set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring a cloud over the earth, the rainbow will be seen in the cloud, and then I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters will never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Now, 
the flood was global, and God is saying, that which I just did, this global flood, I will not do again, right? Some would say that the flood was local, just in a little spot. So if the flood was local, and now God is saying, I'm not going to do again that which I just did, has there been a local flood or two since these days? Yes, right? This is all the more evidence that the flood was global, not local. The rainbow will appear in the crowd, and I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant. Everlasting? How long does that last? Forever? Not just till next Tuesday. Between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now, don't say what the Bible doesn't say. Some people would say, see here, prior to the flood, there were no rainbows. Is that true? Is the flood the first rainbow? No. Might be the first rainbow that's mentioned in literature. But this is not where God established a whole new set of laws of physics relating to light. Rainbows had always been around, but now God is assigning a new significance to the rainbow. So whenever we look up, we can say, ah, pretty rainbow. Of course, the world wants you to think, there's a pot of gold, let me go after it. No, God doesn't want you to think about the leprechaun. He wants you to remember, you know, that which he remembers, that he's made a promise that he's never going to destroy the earth with a flood ever again. And we can also remember, yay, we can eat steak. And we have governments now to hinder evil from taking over. By way of analogy, right, some insist that this is the first rainbow. No, it's entirely possible for God to take something that already exists and to use that as a new illustration for the future. For example, in the Lord's Supper, we have the cup and the bread. Did Jesus invent cup and bread right there at the Lord's Supper? No. It was uh, part of the Passover meal that goes all the way back. Oh, speaking of which, y'all have a Passover meal coming up here. Woo I love that. Love it when churches celebrate Passover. Anyhow, so Jesus, just like Jesus put and said, okay, now the cup and the bread, when you do this, remember the new covenant. Likewise, Whenever the flood was there, the rainbow was out, and God said, now, whenever we look at the rainbow, we can remember the Noah covenant. This is a sign of the covenant. Okie dokie. Any questions? Okay. Um, do I pray them out? 